Good morning. My name is Jeremiah D. Gennaro, and I am a staff member with North Carolina Historic Sites. And this year, I was going to be portraying Philip Alston at the House of the Horseshoe event, The Best Defense We Can. Uh, I was able to portray Alston last year as well. Uh, but of course, this year, since we are transitioning into a virtual event, I was going to make a video to talk a little bit about the man that I'm portraying, to give you a little bit of context about him, uh, his life, and uh, to talk a little bit about what happens to Philip Alston both before the skirmish at House and the Horseshoe, during and after. Uh, of course, one of the questions that I got last year was why I was portraying Alston, and um, one of the main reasons why uh, I was picked to portray him uh, was uh, first because in 1781, Alston was approximately 35 years old, which is the age that I am. And so it helps us to understand historical personalities when we can see them within the proper context at the right age that they would have been. And in the case of Philip Alston, I think it helps us to understand him as well. Uh, because when the Revolutionary War was going on, Alston was a man in his late 20s through his mid-30s. So as a young man on the May, trying to better his lot in life and trying to gain status in North Carolina, uh, he, he would have really looked at military service as something of uh, benefit to him. So uh, being that age is really important to sort of understanding his mindset during this time. So uh, Philip Alston was born in around 1746 in Edgecombe County, what is now Halifax County, and he was the second oldest son of his parents. And that is also a very important thing to know because in the 18th century, uh, it is a little bit more difficult to really take advantage of a family's wealth if you are not the firstborn son. And so uh, Alston has to actually move away from North Carolina. He moves to Georgia. First, he gets married to uh, his wife, Temperance Smith. And he and Temperance move down to Georgia. And with the help of Philip Alston's father, he buys about 350 acres of land and has about 60 pounds of money to his name. And in the 1760s, begins trying to gain a uh, status as a planter in Georgia. However, in the early 1770s, he moves back to Piedmont, North Carolina, and he settles in the Deep River area, uh, what is uh, now Moore County, but at the time was Cumberland County. And he moves here in the early 1770s, purchases thousands of acres of land, and has many enslaved people that are laboring for him. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information about the enslaved community that labored for him and his family, but we do know that there's a very large uh, amount of land that Alston owns, uh, which would correspond to a large number of people uh, that were also here. So once Alston moves to Cumberland County, he begins sort of laying the groundwork of improving his status, gaining more notoriety, gaining more power. And in the 18th century, there are a few ways that you can go about uh, becoming a notable citizen in the area. Uh, one is uh, to have a good amount of property. So a lot of land and a lot of people. And uh, so Alston does uh, fit the bill there. Another way that you can go about it is to get uh, appointed to various political offices, starting at the county level and then working your way up. And then third, another way to uh, gain success and wealth and notoriety in the 18th century is to establish a military career. And Alston does not do that at first, however, only a few years after moving to Cumberland County, the Revolutionary War begins. And so in 1776, Alston is able to get a commission as a major in the Cumberland County Militia. He does side with the Whig or revolutionary side uh, here in North Carolina. It's important to know that North Carolina is fairly well split at this time, and there are uh, very large groups of loyalists who do exist here as well. Uh, but Alston chooses the other side, 
And uh, again, going back to how important military service is uh, and how important Philip Alston's age is at this time, as a man trying to improve his status, um, he is really making a sort of calculated risk, a wager, if you will, by betting on this revolutionary side that as long as they win, he is going to be in a position to benefit after the war is over. And we see examples of loyalists who do the same thing as well, only they bet on the wrong side. So in the uh, first few years of the war, uh, Alston does not see any military service. He stays in Cumberland County. But in 1779, the North Carolina militia is called up and goes down to Georgia, where again, uh, Alston has a little bit of a history, and they fight at the Battle of Briar Creek. And uh, Alston does not do particularly well at Briar Creek. In fact, he is captured. And when he's captured, he is taken to a uh, prison ship called the Roebuck. And he stays a prisoner on the Roebuck for several months. We don't know exactly how long until he is able to escape. Once he escapes the Roebuck, he is able to go back to North Carolina. And he comes back to his house on Deep River, uh, where I'm filming today, uh, what we know today as House in the Horseshoe. And Alston stays here for uh, the late 1770s uh, and into the early 1780s, again, not being overly involved in the military aspect of the Revolutionary War. It's during this time that he is uh, focusing on uh, the uh, other access point to success of uh, finding appointments to uh, various political offices, and so at this point in time, he becomes a justice of the peace. He begins working on his political connections and uh, building friends and allies that will be helpful for him when he begins a political career later on. Uh, however, the war does come back around to Piedmont, North Carolina and in the winter of 1781. Uh, Lord Cornwallis and the British Army are marching through the North Carolina Piedmont, and this emboldens the Loyalists who were uh, still living in this area, and uh, they form various militias that actually go and conduct raids against the Whigs, against the uh, revolutionaries during this time. One of the most notorious Loyalist leaders was a man named David Fanning. Fanning leads several successful raids. He proves to be uh, incredibly difficult to catch. And so in the spring of 1781, Governor Abner Nash authorizes Philip Alston to raise a militia for Cumberland County, uh, not to exceed 100 men. And their mission is solely to catch David Fanning. And so they go riding around um, Cumberland, Chatham, and Wake Counties, trying to find David Fanning, trying to apprehend him. They're largely unsuccessful, but in the course of going through these areas, they do encounter several loyalists, uh, prominent loyalists in uh, some cases. And in um, two examples, uh, there are two loyalist men who are murdered by Alston and his men. Uh, the two we know of are Thomas Taylor and Kenneth Black. And it's these killings that prompt David Fanning to uh, cease trying to evade Philip Alston and to go on the offensive and attack Philip Alston as retribution. And so uh, early in the morning, in uh, late July or early August of 1781, Fanning leads a group here to House in the Horseshoe, and he's able to hit this Whig militia at a time when Alston is coming back to his house. He has disbanded part of the militia so that they can go back to their homes. They will reconvene a little bit later on. However, Alston is a little bit more exposed and does not have as many men with him. And so Fanning is able to surround the house and begin firing into it, demanding the surrender of Alston. Alston and his men try to give the best defense they can, and they fire back from both levels of the house, and in the course of the fighting, which takes about three hours, several uh, Tories are killed outside of the house, and many of Fanning's own, uh, excuse me, many of Alston's own men are injured within the house. And 
After about three hours, Alston is compelled to go outside and surrender to Fanning uh, by his wife, Temperance. She helps broker the surrender between the two men, and after Alston surrenders to Fanning, nothing more is said. Um, even when tensions are incredibly high, people are being murdered based on their political allegiances in North Carolina at this time. Uh, Alston, perhaps rightly thinking that he is going to be killed as a result of being captured, uh, he is actually allowed to, uh, to be let go. And so he signs a parole and uh, says that he will not uh, take part in any military campaigns anymore, and he continues to stay here at House of the Horseshoe uh, until the war's end. After the Revolutionary War, Alston stays in North Carolina and begins to try to develop his political career. And it's at this point in time where we see that Alston is really his own worst enemy. And even though he does have a successful military career during the Revolutionary War, even though he does have appointments uh, and experience in local government, he is not able to win uh, friends and allies in the way that someone with higher political aspirations really should. In fact, he's known for having a very bad temper. Uh, he is referred to by uh, one of his enemies as a very hectoring, domineering man who no gentleman would keep the company of. And these uh, political spats that he finds himself getting into in the 1780s prove to be his undoing. Uh, Alston first tries to run for the state senate, however he is unsuccessful in his first election and is very surprised that uh, he is not elected and in uh, the, the course of this election makes uh, enemies with his political opponent. One of these enemies, George Glasscock, uh, comes to, to be a sort of a political grudge match that will continue through the 1780s. He is able to run for Senate again, this time successfully. However, because of the enemies that he has gained over this time, including George Glasscock, he has people that are trying to get him unseated from the Senate before he's even able to take office. First, they attempt to have him unseated by uh, recalling that he has murdered Tories in cold blood during the Revolutionary War. However, North Carolina's governor, Richard Caswell, pardons Alston, and so legally uh, that is not grounds to expel him from the Senate. Uh, and so his opponents change tack and they attack him because on various um, occasions, Alston has publicly uh, pronounced his atheism uh, and has actually referred to the Bible as a, quote, scarecrow for children. And so they make the argument that an atheist should not hold office in North Carolina, and so he actually is uh, dismissed from the Senate as a result of their actions. And uh, obviously for a man who already has a, a famously bad temper, uh, being dismissed from a political office that he had just won after losing a previous election uh, probably uh, did not do anything good for his temper. And uh, shortly after he uh, loses this Senate seat, that uh, political opponent that I had mentioned, George Glasscock, is found murdered. And uh, it is important to note that Philip Alston is never considered as a suspect in Glasscock's murder. Uh, that is because on the night that Glasscock was killed, Alston made a point to host a very large party with all of his friends who could all corroborate that he was at the party at his house during that time. And so Alston is not considered a suspect uh, in this murder. However, his political aspirations uh, are essentially over after uh, George Glasscock's murder. And eventually Alston does leave North Carolina and uh, attempts to start anew again in Georgia. And uh, while he is in Georgia, uh, in 1791, uh, even though we do not have many details, we do know that Philip Alston himself is murdered. We don't know a lot of details, as I, as I said, but that is the end of the story for Philip Alston, the uh, Whig militia leader, uh, aspiring politician, aspiring planter, an incredibly complicated, uh, slightly nefarious, uh, but also incredibly fascinating 
historical personality. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you do have any questions about Philip Balston or about House of the Horseshoe, uh, please do leave them in the comments and we'll do our best to answer them as quickly as possible. Thank you again for watching. I uh, hope you enjoy our virtual event and we will look forward to when we can see you again at House of the Horseshoe State Historic Site.